I will be talking on the basic drug which we use in type 2 diabetes day in and day out, that is sulfonylurea, and how it is relevant in modern times when we are having a lot of drugs uh, to, I think, uh, target each and every pathophysiological defect which is there in type 2 diabetes, which is described by Professor Ralph de Fronzo in the form of ominous octet. How sulfonylurea is the fare in current times, that is what I'm going to talk about. So they have, sulfonylureas have been classified depending on the hierarchy of development in the conventional and modern sulfonylureas and based on the duration of action they are classified into short acting, intermediate acting and long acting and currently we are having intermediate acting in the form of glipizide, glycolazide and long acting in the form of glimiparide, glycolazide MR and glibenclamide. We all know how they act, so I will not go in details of their mechanism of action, but ultimately they increase insulin release from the beta cells. And that is one of the important pathophysiological defect which is there in type 2 diabetes. This is the PKPD profile of various sulfonylureas which are available, but I will be focusing mainly on modern sulfonylureas which are nowadays being termed as glimiparide, and either glycolazide or glycolazide MR because they have got the best evidence to support their use in type 2 diabetes. Way back in 2014, this paper suggested that sulfonylureas as a second line agent, they generated glycemic control and quality of life adjusted years comparable with newer agents like DPP-4 inhibitors. And this regime was resulted in the longest time to insulin insulin dependence. So this was in 2014 and after that we have uh, observed a sea change in the management of type 2 diabetes. Now we talk about comorbidities based selection of oral antidiabetic drugs because many of newer drugs they are having pleiotropic benefits and because of that probably sulfonylureas which were considered the good agents as far as diabetes management is concerned they are being highlighted as a will, and I will try to justify the major concerns which are there with sulfonylurea, starting with first the myth that is beta cell exhaustion and durability. Do sulfonylureas, they result in beta cell exhaustion and there is accelerate the decline in beta cell function. This is a myth. Even UKPDS data, the principal investigator, Professor Holloman himself said, that no solid evidence for beta cell ex exhaustion in the clinical setting over six years in the UKPDS. It is a natural history of type 2 diabetes and there is no role of sulfonylurea as far as beta cell exhaustion is concerned. This is a small study which was carried out in Korean patients over a period of one year. Patients who are failing on metformin, they were given either sulfonylurea, glimiparide and glargine and their effects on beta cell function in the form of glucagon stimulated C-peptide change that was observed after 48 weeks. Various other parameters were also studied and this showed that the glimiparide was equivalent to glargine as far as glycemic control is concerned, rather it was better and the C-peptide was maintained so it was not associated with any decline in beta cell function, thereby suggesting that it is not associated with beta cell exhaustion. The GREAT study, which is just recently released, which was carried out in USA to find out the best agent to add on top of metformin in type 2 diabetic individuals. And they have divided around uh, 5,000 eligible patients who were having type 2 diabetes duration of less than 10 years with baseline A1C of 6.8 to 8.5% and they were on maximally tolerated dose of metformin, at least one gram and maximum of two gram. And then they were divided in four groups. One group was given glimiparide, second was given DPP-4 inhibitor, that is citagliptin, third was given liraglutide, and fourth group was given insulin glargine. And they have tried to find out their effect on glycemic control, whether they were able to maintain their HbA1c below seven for how long. That is primary outcome and secondary outcome was how long they were able to maintain their HbA1c below 7.5% and tertiary outcome was those 
where the HbA1c was more than 7.5 and further treatment was added, whether they were able to maintain that HbA1c below 7.5. And if you see here, they say that all four drugs, they affect uh, in a variable manner. And the best effect is seen with injectables, that is insulin glargine and liraglutide. But here sulfonylureas, they fared better, far better than citagliptine, thereby suggesting that they have got some durability as compared to DPP-4 inhibitors when added on top of metformin therapy. Another important aspect from this trial, that depending on baseline HbA1c, the response of drugs, they differ. When the baseline HbA1c is 6.8 to 7.2, almost all drugs, they fare equally. But as the baseline HbA1c increase, and when it goes to 7.8 to 8.5, the best is liraglutide, then glargine, they are almost comparable. Then comes glimepiride, and then comes citagliptine. So this gives you a clue that they provide durable glycemic control, and durability is better at least as compared to DPP-4 inhibitors, as evident from this GREAT trial. Let us see how its glycemic efficacy as compared to the newer agents. So this is as compared to DPP-4 inhibitors. They are providing equivalent or better glycemic control, and so it will be suitable for many of the patients. And these are a variety of trials, starting from kenaglyphosin to liraglutide to glargine, to sexagliptin, almost all the trials, they have demonstrated that glycemic efficacy is same, whether you use glimepiride or SGLT2 inhibitor or DPP-4 inhibitor or liraglutide. Only kenagliposin 300 or liraglutide in high dose, they were having better glycemic efficacy as compared to glimepiride. And that's why all the combinations, if you see glycemic efficacy, it is almost same whatever agent you add on top of maximally tolerated metformin therapy. There is concerns about weight gain with sulfonylureas as it was highlighted previously. This is the trial start study which was an open label real world data where they have compared glimepiride metformin with citagliptin metformin and there was no major weight gain was seen with either of the combinations. Same way this is Jodiac 39 trial where they have tried to find out whether adding sulfonylurea to metformin any effect on body weight. And this is a prospective observational cohort study in around 3,000 patients. And the weight was almost same. There was not much weight gain with sulfonylurea in this cohort. And if you see, they have compared three different sulfonylureas. Glyclazide glibenclamide and glimepiride. Here, glimepiride is not associated with any weight gain as compared to glibenclamide or glyclazide. The same has been observed in this study where glimepiride was compared with citagliptine and GLP-1 analog. Again, the weight was almost same. There was no much weight gain with glimepiride in this randomized control trials. The Carolina trial, which established the cardiovascular safety of glimepiride, Again, it has shown that the weight gain was only to the tune of 1.5 kg, although the number of hypoglycemic events were very high in this category of patients in Carolina trial because glimepiride was used in the dose of 1 milligram and then it was titrated to the maximum dose of 4 milligram and the baseline HbA1c in many of these patients was around 6.8 to 7.5. Generally in clinical practice we do not go beyond 2 milligram in this category of patients otherwise it will result in increased risk of hypoglycemia and that was observed in this Carolina trial and in spite of so much hypoglycemia there was not much weight gain observed and the weight gain was to the tune of only 1.5 kg with glimepiride in this trial. Whether the weight gain is detrimental or not, this is a observational data, a retrospective cohort data from the Tehran lipid and glucose study, where they have tr tried to find out whether the weight loss and weight gain, what is their effect on incident CVD and coronary artery events. And they have highlighted that the weight gain of more than 5% was protective as far as cardiovascular events or coronary artery events are concerned, and they concluded that probably the sulfonylurea-induced weight gain has got no major impact on cardiovascular 
outcomes. Although this is a observational data, we cannot find that it is having some causal association. Regarding hypoglycemia, we all agree that sulfonylureas do increase the risk of hypoglycemia, but of that, glimepiride is better, and I think as far as hypoglycemia is concerned, glycolazide and glycolazide modified release, they are having the best evidence of list hypoglycemia, even as compared to glimepiride. This is as compared to DPP-4 inhibitors, but most of the trials, treatment discontinuations because of hypoglycemia is not there, and that is the beauty of these molecules. This is the Carolina trial. Definitely the hypoglycemia was very high, but if you see here, it was for first two or three months that the rate of hypoglycemia increased because of titration of sulfonylurea, and I have already highlighted that it was titrated up to 4 milligram in people who were having baseline A1C of 7.5 only. As far as CV safety is concerned, till date we were not having good evidence, so these are various observational cohort studies where it was quoted that glimepiride was better as compared to either glibenclamide or glipizide in people who were either having coronary artery disease or who were hospitalized with coronary artery disease or likewise. But the Carolina trial and the Tosca IT trial, advanced trial, various trials, they have proven that at least they are not associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events. The Tosca IT was carried out in Italy where patients who are failing on metformin monotherapy, they were either given pioglitazone or sulfonylurea. Most of these patients were either on glimepiride or glycolazide and the cardiovascular outcomes were not different whether you use pioglitazone or sulfonylurea. Although there were many flaws in this trial because at that time the controversy of pioglitazone with bladder cancer came out and because of that many of the people in the pioglitazone arm, they discontinued their medication. Probably that might have skewed the data but still it says that both are equivalent. VADT follow-up data says that if you intensively control based on sulfonylurea therapy, then after 12 years, there will be a significant relative risk reduction in major CV outcomes, although this doesn't prove that glimepiride is providing cardiovascular benefits, but it gives you a clue that it is not associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events. And the main thing, Carolina trial, where linagliptin was compared with glimepiride in around 6,000 patients, uh, median age 64 years, this was a multinational, multicentric trial and where the patients were either given linagliptin or glimepiride and the hazard ratio of cardiovascular outcome was 0.98. So, linagliptin was non-inferior to glimepiride as far as cardiovascular outcomes are concerned. So, this was the trial which established that at least out of sulfonylureas, glimepiride is the drug which when used in patients with established cardiovascular disease or high CV risk does not increase the risk of cardiovascular outcomes as compared to DPP-4 inhibitor linagliptin. And these are the various kaplan meier covers from the same trial. Great trial which I have shown you. Again, they have uh, tested whether the outcomes, they are different when you use different agents on top of metformin therapy. And here they have tried to find out the impact of second line agent on cardiovascular disease, on all-cause mortality, on CV death, on heart failure and various other aspects. And they have concluded that the hazard ratios for any CVD were 1.1 in the glargine group, 1.1 in the glimepiride group, 0.7 in the liraglutide group, and 1.2 in the citagliptin group. So only liraglutide was having some benefit. All other three they were having same impact on CVD when they were added on top of metformin therapy. So another trial which established that at least sulfonylureas, they are not associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events. Special population, when you want to use, you have to be careful because they are associated with increased risk of hypoglycemia in this category of individuals like elderly or renal impairment, then you have to use it in the smallest possible dose. Even during Ramadan, it is associated with an increased risk, but there is data to support use of glycolazide during Ramadan for glycemic control. I will just touch upon three guidelines, that is ADA standards of medical care. They say that modern sulfonylurea has got high efficacy, 
As far as CV outcomes are concerned, it is neutral, cost is low, and renal benefits are again neutral. And we all know that the ADA algorithm now suggests that depending on the presence of established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or renal disease or heart failure, you have to choose your therapy after metformin or even at the beginning, you can start with SGLT2 inhibitor in this category of patients. IDF again says that sulfonylureas, they are neutral as far as major CV events or CHF is concerned. And S again focuses on newer therapies as far as in people who are having underlying cardiovascular disease. So do sulfonylurea still have a place in clinical practice? This is a beautiful article by Professor Kamlesh Kunti. Last slide only. That modern sulfonylureas, they have got robust evidence base, very five decades of experience, very good glycemic efficacy, durability is there. They are weight neutral or marginal weight gain. Hypoglycemia is definitely there, but then you have to use it smartly. They do not increase the risk of cardiovascular events, and definitely they are cost effective, particularly in our country. So they should be used judiciously, preferably in lowest possible effective dose, careful patient selection, and these drugs are only for glycemic benefits. They are only for lowering blood glucose. They have got no other pleiotropic benefits like SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 analogs. So everyone has two sides, good and evil. How you treat me will determine which side you see. That is what sulfonylureas are asking physicians in the current modern times. Thank you very much.